I'm very honored to have Daniel Brandt and Paul Frick next to me, better known as two-thirds of Brandt, Brauer and Frick. Please give them a welcome <laughs> applause. Hey, those are your fans. Yeah, I'm sorry, our friend Jan, he is sick in bed and uh, he says hello to you all, uh, but he just couldn't make it. Uh, five of the last loch. You are a classically trained musician, right? You went to the UDK here in Berlin and um, studied music officially. And uh, how did that affect your career in electronic music? All of us three, we always were interested in a lot of music at the same time. And I think when I was studying, I was surrounded by all these like interesting composer guys who did very experimental things and everything had to be very complex. And in me it created like the contrary, I just needed to do something much more simple. And only then when I was already studying composition, I got aware that actually like a simple element in music, like a techno bass drum, but it can be also something very different, it's not fixed, that it gives you like actually more freedom and that you're... I think I got aware of like um, simplicity in a good way only really late and uh, just basically because I was so pissed off by all the complexity. You started out as a trio. Um, basically you and Jan, you did play together in a school orchestra. And then, no you didn't, okay. Correct me. School band. No, yeah, Jan and me, we played in a school band. We played the best of uh, rock and pop history. And then uh, we found another project called Scott that we did some also with real instrument jazzy house kind of stuff and then we met Paul he was already releasing some house records and was just actually exchanging records in the beginning but then we already had the first date for a session in our old studio in the garage and yeah it was nice so we kept on doing it and um, then you just had the idea wanna transfer our music with a 10 piece orchestra I mean is that something that just comes out of your head from one day to the next it's not that easy to just hire musicians, right? Yeah, we always, I mean, first first we made like our first pieces of music and um, we just happened to use mostly piano and vibraphone and real drums and we thought, okay, how can we perform that? Because we, we thought it's a bit boring, this whole laptop, live act, techno thing, because you don't, yeah, if it's good music, then it's cool, but you can't really see it as a concert. I mean, I respect a lot of the people who do it for their music, but I personally, I like to see like real drama and like a band, and I also really like like big shows, like rock concerts and stuff like that. That's still not totally what we do, but we just thought, how can we perform that? And then we thought, okay, it's, it's too many elements to just play it with three people, because of course we layer elements on top that we improvise or that we play. So we thought, okay, how would it be with more people? I don't know, it's like a very cool social experience to make, to work with so many people at once and travel with them, with uh, 10 musicians, a babysitter, a tour manager, two sound guys, a light guy, some friends even. That's really nice. Do you sometimes also play a key solo and you say, okay, let's see what he's gonna come up with? Or um, do you sometimes play drums and then you say, oh, maybe they'll ha have an idea. How much is actually live and how much is already uh, that you know what you're playing, like in a band? Uh, yeah, I mean, we know the track list before, but we always improvise a lot. So m sometimes they change completely if we're in a good mood or if it's the right spot to doing it, we maybe change the track to a totally different genre. Sometimes we play a track in a dubstep way or in a techno way. It always depends on the crowd and on the atmosphere. There's a lot of room for improvising. We also have parts which can get completely lost. But then what doesn't work, we tried it once in a concert in Belgium, was a complete improvisation with the stuff we had. And that was just a total mess and it sounded shit. 
and the guy from the party said afterwards you should never try that again. So most of the time we do uh, almost the same with improvisation and it's live. Uh, I mean there's loops coming from this machine and there's a keyboard which is obviously live and the drums so and the loops can also be changed and everything. So it's pretty li as, w as live as we can get as three people. So you brought us some as well? Shall we have a look? Yeah, I, c I can. Uh, we can show one song that we are working on. We're actually making a new album right now, and it's it's pretty different from what we've done before. And the thing that I'm gonna show, actually, we were supposed to do to make a remix for somebody, and uh, we, uh, when we make remixes, we don't we take very few of the original, and we jam around a lot. So we got aware. Oh, there's almost nothing more from the original in it. We just made something ourselves. And we kind of liked it a lot and we were like, no, let's throw that original er element from the remix out and let's make it our own track. It's like a pity to release it as a remix. And uh, yeah, that's something that's going to be on our new album. Uh, okay, this is, you see, we recorded all with Ableton Live. This is the work in progress. Uh, also, the song doesn't really have a start at an end. Personally, I don't know what's the most interesting thing about that. So if you ask us something that's very welcome, Maybe we can show it first. That's a random start moment. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, th I think I think when we when we made this or started to make this track, we got aware that because we've been to the UK a lot last year and a, on a lot of festivals and we checked out many other groups and I guess we were very inspired by this whole UK bass music thing. So that kind of naturally flew in and that song shows actually quite well the way we work because. For example, here you have some string chords in it and stuff and um, a lot of times because, for example, we don't play brass or string instruments but we use them the whole, the whole time and we have the players in our ensemble. So what we do is we take like some samples from other pieces of us. For example, for these chords, I think from um, we took some single violin and cello tones from the last ensemble records and somehow transposed them and fit them in. And what we do afterwards is we re-record it all. Like we invite the musicians and we tell them play this and play that. And in the end it always sounds much cooler because there's like more dynamics in it and more real life aspect. But a lot of times when we start a song we do it all really simple and we make quick loops because otherwise we just forget what we wanted. Because we are working on a lot of details that are important but in the moment when you make the music you just need to get sucked into the whole process and not uh, carry worry too much about details maybe how long does it usually take you for you sometimes one day but sometimes also a lot of work uh, more work and this time uh, we because now we're we're gonna work a lot with uh, vocals and for example this is supposed to have vocals so now we are showing it to vocalists and that's a completely new step uh, like in the work progress that makes it of course much slower.
uh, yeah, we are very curious how that works. We already worked with some vocalists and we were always really lucky. But uh, you never know, we still want it to sound like us and that's not easy at all. So we are, we are always thinking like who could sing on this? We just try from the, even before we ask somebody, he must have just the perfect voice to fit on it. Uh, when you say you don't use many microphones, uh, what kind of microphones do you use? Like more uh, the um, yeah, Kleinmembran Mikrofone or eher dynamische or was? Uh, in welche Richtung? Uh, we actually only use one microphone. It's the AKG X. It's not Sennheiser. AKG <laughs> XL SLX 404 or something like that. No, And that's it's, uh, it's uh, C414. Ah, C. C yeah. CX 400. Something, yeah. but it's a very good microphone because it has a very warm sound and you can change the pattern, and that's the cool thing about it. It has a very warm sound. It's not very expensive. It's not very cheap, but it's very good. And most of the times, the experience with this microphone, there was another band I was playing in, and we recorded a lot of stuff. And then the vocal takes we did on really expensive, super crazy mics in a good studio, and then in the end we record them again with this because it sounds better. I don't know what's going on with this microphone, but it's very good. Yes, yeah, also like we don't, we are not really so much into technique, so it's always a bit by chance. But there somehow, I don't know, like the whole first record was only done with this microphone. They should endorse us and stuff. Uh, all recorded in the same room and whatever uh, instrument it was, whether it was uh, drum elements or piano or vibraphone or marimba or strings, always with this basically because the other one we had was shit and we had only two microphones. It was more like in a tiny garage. Now we are a bit... Our studio is still not super fancy, but now we have a few more things. So you really don't get gear crazy and that you say, oh, look at this, I got this new synth or this new drum machine. Oh, yeah, okay. Daniel, I think Daniel, sometimes he clicks on things by on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, usually... Uh, I d we didn't do that for the last two years, but we always went to the Musik Messe in Frankfurt, which is a place where you can check out a lot of gear. It's pretty shitty, actually, but at the same time, you can try out all the gear with, my, with headphones. And after that, I always bought stuff online, and we always, we always try to get new synths. That's, we, are all, we are crazy about cool synths and stuff like that, but we, it's very expensive. We can't buy it very often. Yeah, but we're not so much about other tech, like boring technical stuff. It must be a cool thing and then we buy it if it has cool lights. For example, the Moog Little Fatty has super fat bass. That's what we're using now for the bass all the time. And it's affordable and at the same time it looks very cool like a spaceship. What's, what's the setup that you use for performing live? It's a V drums a setup with uh, six drum pads. Um, and There is a laptop actually, but it's only we, we only have the sounds in Ableton, which I can trigger on the drums. Then we have Cog Electribe. Uh, now we have two of those in the setup, so we have uh, more uh, sample, sample space. space because the sample space is very limited. It's very old, the thing, and but it sounds very cool. And then we have a Nordwave keyboard because in the Nordwave you can sample sounds you uh, recorded, and we have, for example, our prepared piano inside and stuff like this, and then also use it as a synthesizer. Um, I have a question about the vibraphone and marimba and stuff like that. I mean, do you do you like use plugins as well? We also don't own a vibraphone, but uh, we borrowed one uh, sometimes from Daniel's old music school, and we are also using the one from from our percussion player from the ensemble. But in general, it's true that sometimes we also mess around with just keyboard presets or even with Vienna instruments. And uh, there's even a few things that in the end sounded so cool with a fake instrument and sounded just much better than the real ones, which is really paradox. Then we also ended up using the fake one, but usually we always like replay the stuff. Something that works very often is if you mix fake and real. That's usually the best because the fake sounds like from the keyboard or the presets, they have this, like a lot of times they have just the right frequencies to, fix it, to fit into a normal mix or so but they don't have the warmth, they don't have the dirtiness, so you can kind of combine it. Or even for bass drums, sometimes we also even use like a fat club kick, but only the bass, and then we record a really dirty, shitty, our own kick drum, and put just the treble and middle, or some special frequencies that are cool, we put it on top, and we do it a bit like that with a lot of instruments. 
some things in our music that sound fake were actually real and some things that were real uh, sound real were actually fake well did i say it both time you know what kind of vocals do you want to put in this song yeah that's a good question i think uh, the method we are trying now is that we just choose the people that we really trust and we are really fans of them and first we don't want to tell them anything but we just give them our instrumental like uh, that's also b a bit more sparse and with with not so many elements like our music y usually has and first we need to see what comes because we think it's kind of wrong if we say something right away because we might kind of destroy maybe the first feeling that the singer can get like that's more from the belly and not so much from somebody something we have told them but then still it will be uh, obviously we will not obviously we don't always like everything and we are also into yeah until now we have always used rather like one or two or three sentences or something more minimal and yeah it's just more like the pro uh, process of communication and then the singer comes to the studio and we're like yeah that's cool we don't like that but uh, we must confess we're also not very experiment experienced with uh, vocalists because we basically started our project totally instrumental but of course we've all played in bands with uh, singers like a whole youth and stuff shall we hear another song yes. excuse me shall we hear another song yes. it's a remix we made it for a berlin label it's called kalk pets and um yeah it was maybe the first thing we did a side that um that's a bit influenced by this whole UK bass music. And um, yeah, it's really a bastard. It's made out of very different elements, out of strings, but also out of a lot of different basses, like synthesizers. Anyway, here it goes.
nice. Very nice indeed. So you've been, you formed the trio in 2008, right? So it's only been four years, or let's say roughly four years, and you've been become really successful in that year. What was the key to success? I don't know. I don't think there was a real key. I mean, of course, it was good that we suddenly, at some point, we were on a bigger label. I think that gave us a lot of opportunities because with well, before we released on our own labels, very small labels or other labels which are like pretty small, they don't have all these contacts and stuff like that. So m I think the most important thing was that they were getting the music everywhere. And that's, that's the, most, the most important thing. We didn't change our own way of work or didn't really do something special by ourselves. It was more about the management and how they approach the peop the thing you know so i think that's before that we were for many years always sending demos everywhere and recording a lot of stuff and it was always hard that it gets any attention at all public attention because uh, there's so much stuff and of course a label like k7 is is not a huge uh, mega label but at least they have still some old school structures like back in the days when there was still some music business going on and they know how to yeah, access the right people and stuff like that. But before that, we also, the cool thing was we already had good contacts for gigs and stuff for, from other projects. So we used those contacts and played live very quickly at different places. Yeah, it's, it's also when we met, it was cool because they had their contacts. I had a, a few con contacts and all kind of, a lot of, there were a lot of common links already or we were interested in the same stuff. So we also could combine because uh, we knew, uh, the one guy knew a guy who has a club in that city and the other one knew a guy in a club not so far in another city or so. Like this we could maybe play two gigs or so. But you also told me about, I mean, to summarize that, just keep trying, right? Just keep sending out demos and never give up, play gigs, be out there, expose yourself. Yeah, and I think uh, for me it was really cool to try to make music with a lot of different people because like, I don't know, making music is all about the social thing and to really get connection to the people and I don't know, I played in many, uh, many bands where now I thought, okay, that was kind of shit, but then I think, yeah, but I needed to try it because you never know what's gonna work and what, what's not and I don't know, with those two guys at s some point for me it was like that I always went on with my solo stuff, but I discovered like, wow, I can't surprise myself as much as when we are three in a studio and what comes out is much weirder and surprises me more and gives me more drama. So, and uh, I think it, for all us three, it was a bit like that. And so Brandbrauer Frick ate up all of our time more and more like a very cr creepy snake that eats you in the end. You were just telling me about your US tour that you did last year and it was how many gigs and how many days and you still got along with... I mean, what, what were the ups and downs of a US tour? Because I think a lot of people in the room think, wow, that's my biggest dream. I want to be on a US tour, be out there, play 10 gigs and you just shake your head. Yeah, yeah I mean, the US tour, I mean, we did three US tours last year. And we did one very long one, it was 24 days and 19 gigs. And before that we, we didn't know what to expect. Then we went, okay, the first was in Mexico, which was amazing, but then the next after Mexico was Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis is not, a, not famous that there's anything going on in this city, I think. And it was on a Monday. So there were 15 people. It was really strange, the whole atmosphere there, also the guy who organized it. And I think it was even one dollar less if you wear a tie. And um, so everybody was wearing strange ties. So this was like in a shitty movie or something like that. And that was cool. it was still cool. And that's on the weekends, we had good gigs on festivals or bigger shows in New York, LA or stuff like that. They were all really cool. But then there was one time where we played eight gigs in a row or something like that. And seven of them were really unsuccessful. The lowest point was when there was only four people in a theater for 600 people. This was just a booking mistake because our booker thought we will go by car, but our travel manager booked flights 
So in the end, I think we lost money and everything. But it was a lot of fun and it was cool to do it. And we had really good gigs as well. Where it was super amazing. So this, at the end, we were feeling good. But in the, in the middle, we were almost going home and we <laughs> called our manager and said, we, we don't know why we're doing this here. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But the good thing is that there was really a happy end and the last gigs, they were all really cool and in California and Texas and stuff. And it's also like, usually we couldn't sleep more than two or three or four hours and sometimes not at all. So like this was really four weeks of tour and our bodies got like each time more fucked up. And um, the cool thing was that we still got along. There was always like one who somehow managed to get the other two out of the bed. And also a lot of times uh, two had to sleep in one bed. We always played schnick, schnack, schnuck for who can sleep in a bed on his own. We sometimes even had to share blankets. Unfortunately, we're not gay. That would be even much cooler then. Um, yeah. Daniel, you went to the academy as well, uh, Red Bull Music Academy. I went there, I think, 12 years ago in Dublin, and you went? Uh, I went in 2006. Where was that? Melbourne. How did you apply? Um, yeah, the application process was uh, pretty stressful. Now, because it's 30, I think it's 30 pages with a lot of questions from, okay, which are your 10 favorite tracks of all time to when was the last time you cried or draw yourself in a musical universe or stuff like that. So it's not so much fun to do it. But in the end, <laughs> if, it, if, it work out, if it works out and you get in, it's really worth it. So uh, I was happy that I did it um, and I just, did it and I didn't expect anything. Yeah, that was the application process. And what was your experience there? I mean, Melbourne is on the other side of the globe. What did you learn? Yeah, uh, Melbourne was an exciting place anyway, but uh, the mo most important thing was what was going on in the academy. So there was uh, really nice studios and we were all jamming together with 30 people from 30 different countries. So that's something you don't usually get anywhere. So the atmosphere was incredible. I made a lot of friends for life and I'm still making music with them sometimes and it's just a really good experience. And after that, you suddenly, I suddenly had uh, friends in all over the world. So it was pretty crazy. And the good thing about uh, this is it's not like a holiday. Normally when you go on a holiday, for example, ski holiday, you meet some people and say, yeah, cool, we meet again. But then you don't have anything to talk with them other than, yeah, you remember when we went skiing, yeah, it was cool. But if you make music together, you have always something you can do together. So jamming together is like communication as well. So that's much more fun. And then we also have this network of people who were there in that time. And we always try to get booked together on some parties all around the world. So it's, it's, it was really, really good. I think I just saw this picture of you. I think it's you on the drums, L.O. Black singing and the bass player from Funkadelic or something like that. I think that was from there. It's pretty amazing. Actually, Jan and I, at some moment, Daniel convinced us to apply for the Red Bull Music Academy, but they didn't take Jan and me. Well, you can still apply again. But, uh, but I really wrote stuff like, well, the last time I cried and so on, I tried. I mean. What is your direction? Like, where do you want to go? Maybe we have a certain points where we know where we don't want to go. We always want to keep on working with our friends and people that we come up with and sometimes it's also hard to not get stuck in the industry and stuff so we are, have a, a few things we are sure that we don't want to do but about the whole rest of the music until now it has all come naturally maybe of course now the next album will be very different because we are a bit bored by what we've done until now for example we are, have been very purist we have said okay this rec record only with the ensemble only live recorded now we uh, make a bit the contrary we want to be free again but that comes only we don't have a long term long time perspective it's more like uh, we are three people and what comes out is Brandbrauer Frick you creating the psychological space for you to make those moments of magic those points in time when you actually make something beautiful because 90% of the fucking time, most musicians make shit. And 10%, we stumble across clarity, right? Is there something you do together? Is there, is there a ritual you partake in that fosters those moments? 
I would say that usually when the three of us, we are in the studio or in one room, it creates a certain ambience because we usually talk a lot. And now, of course, we know each other very well. We are like married because we have spent probably 360 days together in 2011. But there's nothing really fixed that we do, actually. And also the moments of magic, if there are some, they don't always come. We also make some stuff that we just throw into the garbage. It's more like it's more like we always give each other this distance to listen to it again a couple of days uh, afterwards. And a lot of times we say, no, forget it. It wasn't cool. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Paul. Great that you were here. <laughs>